Hello. In this episode, we'll look at one of Brunel's less successful ventures. This venture was born out of his involvement and, in fact, leadership of the construction of the Great Western Railway, first from London to Bristol and then on into the southwest of England. The railway reached Bristol in 1841 and Exeter in 1844. At that point, Brunel became the chief engineer of the South Devon Railway, which was incorporated in 1844. Effectively, this was common practice to incorporate a new railway company, which would later be absorbed by the parent company, in this case, GWR. He chose a scenic route down the west bank of the river and along the seashore from Dawlish to Tynemouth, where trains still run a very short distance from the sea. He persuaded the directors of the South Devon Railway to approve the latest propulsion system, which had only been tried on a couple of test tracks. This system was invented by two engineers, William Clegg and Jacob Samuda. His reason for adopting the system was that the terrain was difficult and the system could help him deal with steeper gradients. There was another reason. Brunel was always looking for improvements in efficiency. He calculated that at least a third of the fuel used by locomotives was just to move its own weight. And the re only the rest was used to pull the carriages. If this could be eliminated, enormous savings could be made. And there were people who said that Brunel was extravagant. <laughs> this was to be the first railway designed from the start to be atmospheric. Let me explain. The term atmospheric railway isn't about the lighting and music in the carriages. It's about propulsion. The rails were normal, well, normal by Brunel standards. South Devon track was connected to the GWR, so they were wide gauge. The difference was that on the sleepers and between the rails was a cast iron tube, 15 inches in diameter, as you can see here. These are original examples. A close fitting piston ran along the inside of the tube and was connected to the leading passenger car. Air was pumped out of the tube in front of the train, thus creating a back vacuum. The piston was pushed along by the pressure of the atmosphere behind, pulling the train with it, hence the term atmospheric. The piston was connected to the train by a rod which passed through a three inch wide slot along the top of the cast iron tube. The slot was closed by a continuous flap of leather strengthened with iron framing and hinged along an edge uh, to the other side, closing on the opposite side of the slot. The whole thing was made airtight with grease. The leather flap lifted to allow the rod to pass and then was pressed shut again with a roller behind. The vacuum was created by huge Bolton and Watt steam engines driving air pumps in pump houses every three or so miles along the track. This created an enormous force. For example, if they pumped half the air out of the tube ahead of the train, the lower pressure inside was only eight pounds per square inch. Then the force acting on the piston would be more than half a ton, which could easily pull a light train. The South Devon Atmospheric Railway opened to the public in September 1847 and by January 1848, atmospheric trains were running all the way from Exeter to Newton Abbott. When the train reached the station, they telegraphed ahead to the next pump house and told them to switch on the pumps to make a vacuum ahead of the train. When all the passengers were aboard, the brake was released and the train zoomed out of the station silently. The trains were quiet and smooth without steam, smoke or smuts. They were also fast. Speeds of 40 to 50 miles an hour were normal, and one train ran from Newton Abbott to Exeter in 20 minutes, which is faster than trains can do it today. As the trains didn't need locomotives, they were much lighter and had good acceleration and deceleration. Also, the rails could be lighter and cheaper. This system cost about £300,000 to install, about £45 million in today's money, and worked quite well for almost a year, but then it ran into all sorts of problems. The main one was the leather flap along the top.
This flap had to be there to maintain the vacuum, but in the winter it sometimes froze solid and let in the air. In the summer the heat dried out the grease and again caused air leakages. In an effort to solve the problem and maintain the vacuum, greasers, no, greasers, walked along the track coating the leather flap with a seal or whale oil. Unfortunately, the oil is said to have attracted rats that ate the grease coated leather. That didn't do the vacuum any good at all. There were also pumping problems. When they switched on in the morning, each pumping station was like the inside of a vacuum cleaner bag. First rush of air brought a mixture of oily water, rust, dead rats and mice, and so on. The telegraph, which was a new technology, never really worked properly, and the leather seals continued to leak, so the pumps had to be run continuously to maintain the vacuum, and this was very expensive. There were other technical hitches. Atmospheric trains could not reverse if they overran the platform, even by a few yards. Passengers sometimes had to jump out and push the train back. The system was also very vulnerable. It only needed one pumping station to fail to shut down the entire line. With the atmospheric system, shunting around stations was impossible. What is more, no one really solved the problem of points. One track could not reach another because there was no way of getting the train across the cylinder between the rails. You can see here how high it was. As a result of all these problems and mounting debts, the South Devon Railway decided to cut its losses and go back to the traditional track with steam locomotives. The last atmospheric train ran on Sunday the 10th of September 1848 and then the system was closed down forever. This is probably the biggest blunder that Isabard Kingdom Brunel ever made. In his defence, it has to be remembered that he was on average doing about 20 different jobs at the same time. And at this point in life, he was also building ships, railways, bridges, docks and a host of other things. He also had a family life. Who knows how he managed it all? But ships, oh yes, he built some of the most important ships in the history of shipbuilding. But that's what we'll talk about in the next episode. Bye for now.